I know it's sort of putting you both in the spot a little bit because it's the first time you've seen the film, but I'm curious uh, as to your general reaction. I mean, obviously there are some dramatic license that's been taken, but do, does it does it get Turing's life and work right, as, essentially? Uh, you're the Turing medalist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so I love... Uh, wait. Is that... Uh, uh, Okay. Here, take mine off. <laughs> so I, uh, I love the movie. I thought it was a great movie. I thought uh, it doesn't do justice uh, to uh, what uh, Turing did. It was uh, way more than just breaking the enigma. Mm -hmm. And that is the only part that was done in the movie. But I thought that with the licenses that uh, it took was actually very good uh, in capturing uh, a lot uh, of uh, Turing personality in general uh, and doing science. And um, uh, so, for instance, uh, I, uh, in particular, was, I was struck by the loneliness of the business which was actually portrayed, even though science is a very social process. The moment you make it, you are actually alone. And if you notice that there is no collective triumph after the Enigma wins, that he, I was expecting, and instead, actually, I think the director was very smart in having just a, a private moment of uh, success. And then even the small group, he couldn't share the big success. <laughs> so it was even more and more isolation as they even strived to do something socially meaningful for, uh, for, um, for the war. Uh, yeah, in fact, I, 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 I have a, this, a complaint about, it's actually, it's not about Turing medalists because I love Turing medalists, but about um, the, the notion of the lone genius figuring out everything. Um, uh, certainly, my experience of doing science uh, is that uh, it's a much more communal kind of venture. And even though there are amazing geniuses out there who, who you know, make lots of contributions, it's really done by groups of people. Um, uh, and, uh, and portraying, there were lots of bits, some of the things I thought were factually a little inaccurate, all the bits of saying, Turing did this, Turing this, he wrote to Churchill, you know, if you actually go and look at the, the history, it was much more a, a common effort amongst, amongst many different people. Um, of course, you know, for kind of the purposes of a movie about science, then it's important to, to portray him as, as a lone genius. And, um, and, and even though, you know, Turing, um, he, he did uh, have uh, symptoms that we would call now today like Asperger's uh, syndrome, though actually about 50% of my students at MIT exhibit symptoms like this. I don't really, <laughs> I don't really regard this as being you know, some kind of inhuman thing, and they're very social people as well. So I, I thought that the, the, um, the build-up to his isolation was also maybe a little unfair to, uh, to the depiction of what was happening. Um, and indeed, I, I, I felt, I, I kind of felt it was a little sexist as well, um, if I may say so, that, that actually women made much larger contribution to the breaking of the Enigma Code than, than was portrayed. Uh, uh, it was, you know, okay, it was just uh, Kira Knightley and then all these women who are just secretaries. This is really not true as, as what, what actually happened in the, the breaking of the code. It was a joint effort amongst many men and, and women. Actually, who here has seen, there's a great uh, PBS series, Bletchley Park? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a great series. And, and, um, uh, and you know, there were, women were involved in many, many more aspects of the breaking of the code. So, I mean, this is what you have to take, you know. I, I'm happy that, I'm happy for our sakes that, that society glorifies, like, great scientists, like, you know. <laughs> so you're here, <right? laughs> but 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 I, I I do I really object to this uh, you know the kind of this notion that there's the great man out there doing this and and then you know Kira Knightley gets to be more brilliant than him but you know come on it was it was a, a joint effort of many men and women doing doing this and breaking this code um, so that was my main objection I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Sylvia, you mentioned um, that Turing accomplished so much more than is depicted in the film. Can you talk a little bit about his, his other accomplishments that the film couldn't quite squeeze Well, in? you know, uh, somehow is really the conceptualization of a Turing machine that is not part of a movie. You just see a realization with wires and things. But uh, that was really a triumph of, uh, of uh, 
imagination, they always ascribe it to him. We talk about a lot of imagination, imagination, but it's in the words, right? So you don't see somehow this, this part. And so what, is, uh, what I'm amazed about Turing uh, is uh, there are many ways to, to be a scientist, of course. There is not only one way, and, uh, and uh, you are, we are all encouraged to find our own ways. But uh, um, Alan was uh, very unique uh, in, uh, in trying to solve a problem by conceptualization. So sometimes you, you have a brilliant techniques of uh, lots of uh, computation, which is uh, the most popular way to portray doing science. And instead, what he did is that he simplified, he simplified, he simplified, he simplified problems by modeling better and better and better and better until such a time in which the problem has become so simple that it almost solved itself. And you wondered what the hell was all this uh, difficulty about, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so that part uh, of uh, Turing, which I believe is really the most uh, uh, perennial part of his contribution is not here at all, and uh, so his conceptual abstract simplicity is not here at all. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but, uh, but again, you know, is <laughs> uh, no man like Turing can be reduced to uh, two hours, even with the help of uh, so many props, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually completely agree with you, Silvio, that, that Turing's amazing abstraction was to take the notion of somebody thinking and doing a computation and then, and then to turn it into a notion of a machine. Um, and so the Turing's uh, uh, eponymous machine, can I use the word eponymous in public? Yeah, so the Turing machine is, a, is a, a, an abstraction of the idea of computation. And um, uh, he, he had this picture that, that uh, actually of a mathematician, and actually in this case the mathematician was a woman because we called it a computer because the people who were com a computer at that point were, were the people, generally women, because women are better at math than men. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, no, was, this is true, they were more accurate about it. So they, they were performing these calculations and they had a problem they were trying to work out. They had a stack of paper and they would, Turing said, okay, what are, what are these computers doing? What are they, these women mathematicians doing? They're taking the paper, they have an idea of what they want to do. They write something on the paper. They look at it. They move it over here. They take another sheet of paper. They write something on it. They look at that and say, hmm. They put it back. They take this other sheet. They, you know, they erase something there. They change it there. All the time, something is going on inside their head while they're thinking about what's going on. And then they keep on going. And if they make do things very precisely, then they'll come up with the answer to the problem. And Turing's machine was a picture of a machine that had sheets of paper. He called them a tape made of, of squares. And the, the Turing machine has a head. And the head looks at each square and changes the set of symbols on this square, moves it aside, changes what's in their head, and then moves it aside, goes back and look at other pieces, and just moves these back and forth. And Turing had this amazing abstraction that you were, that you were, that you were referring to, Silvio, that, that uh, uh, somehow you could actually just by looking at what happens, you could say, well, if everything, if the number of possible thoughts inside the head is finite, if the number of possible symbols on the tape is finite, then all a computer is doing is going and changing these symbols, changing the thoughts in their head, and moving it through. And this is an amazing, actually, abstraction, which is really does deserve to, uh, to be honored tremendously. The notion that, that computation consists of of a, a machine actually simply changing things bit by bit, and you can build up arbitrarily complicated computations from this process. As long as the people are women, the men make all these mistakes, you know, that's like, it's good. <laughs> okay, and so the, the film obviously leaves off in 1954, but I'm wondering, what about the legacy today, in, especially in related to your field in quantum mechanics and cryptography? Can you speak a little bit about um, how Turing's work maybe continues to impact your fields. Mm -hmm. Right, so certain, um, certain things, like even the, the, the name imitation game, right, that is this idea that essentially is uh, the germ of uh, artificial intelligence, right, that you know, if you cannot distinguish if you're talking to a computer to a person, right? So, um, so that uh, led to um, uh, another uh, um, abstraction, which is the indistinguishability, computational indistinguishability between actually uh, mathematical objects, not only the behavior, but just even uh, the mathematical object in, in himself, in themselves, that they are very, very good. But, but I really believe that you know, if you have to look at uh, the legacy of, uh, of Turing uh, is uh, really something that he has not done. So he has actually like a kind of a prophet has brought us to the promised land and he, 
it died before <laughs> somehow uh, realizing and finishing his journey. And so in my opinion, the legacy of, uh, of uh, Turing machines really is, and the Turing himself is really the notion of complexity. That uh, without this uh, formalization of machines, we would not have been able to, to grasp. And so and that is a really a, a revolution in mathematics and uh, beyond the mathematics in human thought. That uh, the notion is that you no longer find, look about the existence in abstract of a solution. You actually find, you know, how, how long does it take to find a solution? And I really believe that, uh, so in this point, essentially, uh, Turing uh, is the beginner of something rather than the climax of, of uh, is not the pinnacle or some, some other field, is really the beginning, the beginner of a field. And I think that complexity is going to serve as a humanity in, uh, for a long, long time. So, um, I mean, we're very much accustomed to thinking about how much computers can do for us, including wasting our time in dramatic fashions and really messing with our brains. Um, but um, uh, it's, it's very important to remember what computers can't do for us. I mean, the number of things for which there is no app for include 95 or 99 percent of the things that I like doing in my everyday life. And um, uh, Turing's very first work, his, his most famous paper, um, uh, in which he proposed this notion of a Turing machine, was actually proposed to show what was impossible for computers to do. He proposed something called the halting problem, um, where uh, the question was, can you tell if you give an input to a computer, like you, know, you press a button on your iPhone, for instance, is it going to do anything at all, let alone what you want it to do? And what Turing proved is that you can't, in general, know that that's true. You can't know if the, the computer will do anything all, at all. You can't know if it's going to do what you want. This, I call this actually, th this has great effect on our everyday life because it means um, that computers will always mess with our brains. There's no universal debugging program to get all of, of, all of the rid of all the bugs in computer programs because we can't, such a program would have to take as input a computer program and say, does this program work? And Turing's paper from, uh, from 1934 actually showed it can't, we can't actually find this to be the case. We'll never be able to get computers to behave in the way that we want them to. I mean, this actually means that computers are much more human than we'd like to think. You know, they, they're always going to be messing with our minds. Um, and of course, this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, points that the movie came to. Um, uh, came back to multiple times. Uh, I, I, I thought it portrayed it in a kind of cartoonish way. Turing is trying to create this computer that's going to you know, be a, like a human being. But in fact, this really was uh, a large part of his motivation. So Turing, when he, um, when he was at Cambridge, um, he uh, actually he, he was very much affected by the death of his, of his friend, um, who was maybe the love of his life, Christopher Morecambe. It caused him to give up uh, religion. He became an atheist. And he also decided that, that everything that took place in the brain was mechanistic. It would, could be described just by the, the laws of physics. Uh, interestingly, at the same time, maybe because he was so grieved over the, over the death, death of the person he loved, he also thought that the spirit survived after death and that in some sense we were still there. It's very interesting to be both Mechanistic, have a mechanistic view of what's going on in our heads and also to believe that the spirit still survived. Um, at that point, he, he started studying quantum mechanics. So he was, in fact, um, he was reading uh, uh, Arthur Eddington's book about physical law, which was one of the very uh, first books, I think it was 1928 or something was published, that publicized quantum mechanics, which is, you know, quantum mechanics is, is, which is what I work on about quantum computers and how you store bits at the level of individual atoms and use that method to process uh, information in wacky ways you can't do classically. Quantum mechanics is weird and strange and counterintuitive. And Eddington's book was the first book that brought it to uh, uh, the masses, as it were. And um, part of this book, actually, Eddington said that uh, quantum mechanics is intrinsically chancy, so uh, chance events can occur. And Eddington said, this means that human beings at last have free will. It was, it's an interesting statement because, um, you know, uh, uh, as long as 2,000 years ago, uh, Epicurus said, oh, we have free will because of the swerve. 
you know, the, the atoms take this, or they move in deterministic ways, as Democritus said, but then every now and then one gives us a tiny swerve that is completely chancy. And so we can't predict what the atoms will do. And for thousands of years, many people thought that free will arose because there's some chance event in our brain. Um, and then Turing, so Turing became enamored of this, and then very wisely, I think, he went and started to talk about these questions of what machines can decide and what they can do. But now, I think, uh, ironically, now that our machines, uh, our, our computers, actually exhibit lots of free will on their part, in fact, the, the first time, this, and this is getting apropos, I don't want to go on too long about this. The first time I ever, I gave a talk about free will, first time I had my iPhone, I'd never talked with Siri before, and I was giving this talk, and I said, on free will, I, I said, I took out uh, my iPhone, and I said, well, Siri, would you like to go out for a beer after, after the talk? And Siri said, this is about you, Seth, not about me. So. <laughs> <laughs> but but there, in, in fact, this, this Turing's uh, beautiful first work on this showing the limitations of computers is, is what uh, I think is what is really uh, really comes to, to me at any way, looking at you know, the app world today. Um, actually, this question of you know, whether a computer can halt or not, I think is deeply related to free will. So, so one of the, the consequences of Turing's beautiful theorems in this the paper is that, that no machine that even has a, a remote sense of self-reference, you know, it doesn't have to be a conscious machine like us human beings, but even the operating system in your smartphone, if it asks what it's gonna be doing in five minutes time, it won't be able to know this. It won't be able to decide this. This is, which is, to me is the essence of free will. I, I wanna make a decision, you know, should I ask Siri for another date after she blew me off the last time? Uh, uh, and, and, and I won't know beforehand what the decision will be any more than Siri could do that. Uh, so I think actually that one of Turing's great insight, which is more important these days than ever, is that, that, that uh, computers are limited in what they can do in very similar ways to the ways that human beings are limited in what they can do. Great. I, I think we have time for a few questions from the audience, if, uh, right there. Well, uh, first of all, you say the social acceleration of the machine. Uh, before we get there, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the machine acceleration of the social, many of us. So for, uh, so in particular, we all wear glasses, at least many of us, right? So, and uh, uh, very soon I'd like to have, you know, um, uh, Google in my head to help me out with my human uh, things. So very often I believe that uh, there is going to be a bidirectional road in this. So in, the, in, in, in technical terms, it is a true fact that uh, the Germans have been very proper. They could guess uh, exactly, you know, dear Herr Captain with all the titles at the beginning and then the rest. And that was uh, uh, very instrumental in, uh, in breaking the code. Uh, unfortunately, and that uh, uh, right now it is possible to make codes which are immune to this type of tax in some kind of provably. In fact, Right now, the, the definition of what is uh, a, a secure code is that even if you know already that what is going to be transmitted is either A, message A, or message B. And then I give you an encryption that I guarantee you is of one of the two. Right? In fact, I flip a coin, I choose between A and B, and then I'll give you A, a possibility, the second possibility B, and I give you a cryptogram, which is the encryption of the one of the two, and I told you, tell you, I'm going to choose between A and B at random. And you cannot do, the code is secure, if you cannot improve better than 50-50 the, uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to distinguish which of the two messages corresponded to this cryptogram. And so in some sense, if the codes have been this way, then uh, this <laughs> particular help would have not helped. 
and the Enigma would have been <laughs> really unbreakable. So uh, that is the uh, more current uh, state of affairs, yeah. Yeah, so they, they, indeed, they, this is called a plain text attack. If you know part of your message, then it gives you some way to figure out how the rest was encoded. And the Enigma machine was vulnerable to these plain text attacks. And indeed, it was a, a very important part about their uh, being able to decode that. I mean, the, the, <laughs> though they made a big deal out of the fact that the messages ended with Heil Hitler was actually important for them to be able to uh, decode the rest of that. Um, but as Silvio says, the, uh, uh, nowadays, the, uh, since people are aware that the, of these plain text attacks, now codes are immune to this. So you could know 95% you know of the message beforehand, and still, uh, with a good code, you would still not be able to decode the remaining 5%. Another question uh, in, over there? So, so actually, uh, my my sympathy really goes to you know the Turing test keeps on going every year. They have a big Turing test with human beings and machines uh, who are answering questions. And my sympathy really goes to the people who fail the Turing test. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you say to somebody? It's like, I'm sorry, dude, you just failed the Turing test, right? So, so this is not, um, you know, uh, this it, it is a wonderful idea, um, uh, uh, and. Uh, and yet, of course, there are always going to be people who fail the Turing test as well as machines. I mean, they actually were kind of playing on the, off of this in the movie. So it, it, it does, it's not really quite clear what this Turing test tells you. If you have a, a, a one of the very early uh, Turing test candidates was this program called ELISA, uh, which, uh, which simulated the, the, uh, the statements of a Rogerian therapist. And, and now, I don't know what Rogerian therapy really is, but I, don't, I have interacted with Eliza, and I have to say that Rogerian therapists are incredibly annoying. <laughs> you say, I'm not feeling well, and they say, why are you not feeling well? They say, well, I had a bad day. What, what, what constitutes a bad day? I, I'm mad at my mother. Are you really mad at your mother? You know, so anyway, uh, maybe, maybe Rogerian therapists are relatively easy to simulate uh, <laughs> compared with other human beings. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that this, um, uh, this is a beautiful idea. And in fact, um, uh, in writing these about these ideas about free will, I propose a Turing test for free will. Do you know, can you, can you really just, do you really know what you're going to be, you know, are you going to go out to have a beer after, after this, this, uh, this gathering or just going to drive home? I, I don't know. So, but I think that it's in a way, it's a beautiful symbol of Turing wondering about this question, what it means to be human. But I don't know how much it actually tells us about whether things are human or not. Well, you know, let me, um, I believe that the Turing's test is a fundamental step in the way we understand the world and uh, not literally in between the, because essentially what you make a change in which what things are not from the ontological platform and you bring it to the operational one so rather than asking anymore what does it mean to be it whatever it is all of a sudden be Simon saying well if I cannot distinguish it from that then uh, then I should be conceptually honest and uh, essentially identify the two of them. And uh, if you are ready to take an operational rather than an ontological view of the world, the world actually becomes much richer. So even though you collapse things, you can actually realize that you can do many more things. And that is really a fundamental insight. And uh, we all need the heroes, and we can describe it to Turing or to somebody else. But uh, I'd love very much in, uh, the, in this uh, humanistic view of science to attribute to Turing, because that is really the essence of uh, when we really make a very big difference in, we, in which we approach reality. And that has opened up uh, uh, to us you know, lots of doors, and, uh, and we have not seen the end of it. Yeah, in fact, if I may add to that, I completely agree with that. And th that it's not the thing I, I, I'd say the Turing test, there's not going to be a moment where suddenly you know, computers and, I, and smartphones uh, 
are, are treated as being conscious, you know, or having consciousness. But I suspect that much more likely is that, that over the course of probably of decades, or maybe 100 years or so, that we'll gradually become accustomed to treating uh, thinking machines as if they were conscious, as if we could talk to them. And you know, we'll start, start gradually to ease into that. In fact, I, I think a good sign for this is, you know, at a certain point, if, you're, if your computer asks you not to turn it off for the night, and you say, oh, OK, fine, like, like a teenager who wants to stay up late, then um, you know, at that point, they're getting, we're getting pretty close. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is that there is not a Turing test. It's so we are so enamored with ourselves that every test is, are we a machine? Because our the, the main uh, fear is to be a machine. What happens to free will? You know, we live very fine to be ma with machines. I'm not worried about that. But I really believe that the, the Turing test is not one. It's a lot of Turing tests. So for instance, our approach to, to randomness is really a Turing test, right? So you, essentially, you want to know, you talk to a, a computer who has only a few random bits and then uh, spits you out a random answer to your queries, or are you talking to a truly random function? And the question is that, you know, if you cannot distinguish to, to which of the two you're talking, either a computer who has a very limited amount of randomness or uh, essentially a truly random function, that is another Turing test, right? So what I'm saying, there is the Turing test literally, and then there is the Turing test as a metaphor, as a platform to which, you know, to to dive uh, from a much um, uh, uh, longer adventures. And, uh, and that, I think, it, uh, that is actually continue to be alive and well. And is not one, but is many. And if you start looking at the world in the, as a sequence of Turing test, I think <laughs> you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think when we actually include machines as judges in the Turing test, then we'll be there. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid, actually, we're going to have to call it a night. But thank you so much to everyone for coming out. Thank you to Seth and Silvio, and uh, the imitation game opens here in December, so if you enjoyed it, please tell a friend to come see it here at the Coolidge. Thanks so much. Thanks,